Good evening, everyone. Glad y'all are here. Come on in. Let's find a uh, seat. Grab a hymn book and uh, select the hymn tonight from, as usual, on Sunday nights. Audrey. Three. Three. Three eighty-seven. temptation for yielding a sin. Amen. And uh, I love Romans chapter 6. Talks a lot about that. Lift it up to the Lord on that first verse. Hymn 387. Yield not to temptation for yielding a sin. Each victory will help you some other to win. Find many from onward dark passions of I'm glad he lives tonight, amen. We're the only faith that can sing this, amen. You know, there, there are other faiths. they got to have the same faith. But hey, our faith is alive because it's based on Jesus Christ. Amen. Lift it up to the Lord. He lives. I serve a risen Savior. I serve a risen Savior.
Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, I mean, it should, right? It should just make you excited that Jesus Christ is alive. It does me. I love, I love this song. It's a good song. Amen. Lift it up to the Lord on that last verse. Here we go.
life is worth the living. Are you living a life worth living? I mean, if he's really alive, it's worth living. Hey, when the scripture says that, uh, uh, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, right? But be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Is it worth being a living sacrifice? If he's alive, it is, right? And uh, listen, if you serve a risen Savior and we're really going to see him one day, it's worth living for him, isn't it? And uh, thank the Lord for that. Good to see you tonight on this Sunday evening and hope you've had a, a wonderful day. Anybody been warm today? Amen. And uh, hey, now that you're in the church house, anybody been cold today? Got a couple of you and a few of you not. And uh, amen. Hey, I didn't notice this. When you sing down there, it's a lot cooler down there than it is up here. So if you're, if you're cold, then uh, we might just make you an area on the platform and let you sit up here. We'll maybe put you some seating in the baptistry or something. And, uh, yeah, put a tie and a jacket on and lead music, and you will warm up very quickly, <laughs> trust me. And uh, so it's good to see you. Thank you for being here. Let's pray. I ask the Lord's blessings on the evening service, and then we're going to move right on ahead uh, with the service. Let's pray. Lord, we sure love you, and uh, we thank you for the day that you've given us. Lord, it sure is good to know you. And, uh, Lord, to be a part of a church and to be part of a church family and, Lord, to be uh, able to, to come and spend time in worship of you and, Lord, to know that we do serve a risen Savior, Lord, a Savior we can trust and a Savior we can go to in prayer and a Savior, Lord, that we, we know is coming back soon. And God, I pray that tonight, Lord, you'd meet with us once again. Would your spirit be evident in the service? Uh, Lord, from the song service to the final amen, we just ask that your presence would be made, would be made known. And, uh, Lord, that you would, uh, you would have your will and way done in everything said and done tonight. We thank you for our guests who are here this evening. I ask your blessings upon not only the singing tonight, but also the preaching of your word. May it uplift hearts. May it convict. May it draw us closer to you. And, uh, Lord, most importantly, if there's one here that's lost, Lord, help them to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus even tonight. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And you can be seated there. It's good to see you tonight. And I uh, want to let you know if you see a couple extra instruments up here. And uh, we, we found some folks on the side of the road. They looked like they needed somewhere to go to church. And uh, they said, have banjo, we'll play. And we said, come on to church. And uh, no, many of us, you might remember, uh, the McClure stopped in one night. Uh, I guess it's been a couple months now. I guess it was back in March. Maybe March, April, somewhere around there, but I know it was before the men's advance. That's all I remember. And, uh, and so uh, we asked them to come uh, this evening, and uh, Brother, Brother McClure will be preaching tonight. Uh, missionaries to the Northern Mariana Islands. How many of you, all right, now be honest, how many of you went home and Googled it? Nobody. How many, <laughs> I'm just curious, and uh, how many of you actually know where they're at? A few of you do, okay. Some of them didn't Google, but they used another way to find, figure out where it's at. No, <laughs> and uh, so uh, some of y'all, some of y'all may have looked at the display already, and you went, "Oh." <laughs> now, it, some of you shaking your heads, yeah. Hey, yeah, I know this. If you look on Google, right, and uh, Google's pin is way out here in the middle of the ocean, you're like, it's a blue screen. And you're waiting for your phone to load. Nothing's loading, nothing's loading, nothing's loading. You start zooming out. And way over here, on the, on the side of the, the little red dot, way over this way, oh, look, there is an island. I'm not waiting for it to load. The pin is in the wrong spot. And uh, it's because there's a lot of islands, and, you know, and uh, so they, they didn't pin one particular one. They have beautiful beaches at their next mission trip. Mission trip to the Northern Mariana <laughs> Islands. Amen. And so there we are. Something tells me they might have a beach or two there. I, I'm not sure. <laughs> And uh, beautiful beaches, well, you know, we'll see. And uh, pray for my wife, and uh, she's, she's trying to get closer to the Lord. And uh, so, well, what can we say? Well, it's good to have them here tonight, and uh, they'll be singing for us. And uh, they ask, can we play uh, the instruments? And I've been waiting to hear them play, and I can't hear them play because y'all are singing. So everybody quit singing, so I want to hear them play while the congregation is going. No, uh, it's good for the, uh, good to see that. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of jealous as I'm watching over there, like, which chords they're playing, and I'm looking to see... Well, not on the banjo. I don't have any idea how to play the banjo. But uh, Mrs. McClure watching on the guitar. I was like, oh, that's a G. That's a D. And I'm watching some of the chords that I actually know. And uh, that's a blessing. But uh, amen. Yeah, all two of them. Ah, I know a few. I can. I know, see, I know a C and an E and an A. And uh, don't ask me to play a B. Cannot get those bar chords down. And even an F, 
I, I still can't get an F down. So hey, now, if, if we were in college, it's just fine. But on the guitar, no way. And so, some of y'all think about that for a moment. There you go. You got it. Yeah. <laughs> Sent that to him by freight. <laughs> Amen. It's good to have him, them here uh, with us tonight. Y'all make sure to get by and uh, visit with them. Make sure to get by and get a prayer card, okay? And, uh, and be in prayer for them as they uh, m make their way around through some deputation trails. And a uh, blessing to have them. They were all the way in Chickasaw, uh, uh, Chickasaw, Chickasaw, Chickasaw. Chickasha, yeah, Chickasha, Chickasha, bless you either way, yeah. Now, they were up in the Indian Nation there uh, in Oklahoma uh, this morning and uh, drove in this, this afternoon, but good to have them here, good to have our friends with us. We had a good time uh, just kind of reminiscing a little bit with some of our friends, and uh, Kevin and I, we, uh, we didn't just reminisce, then we started pulling out guns, and uh, you know, you see, you bring some... It's okay, Audrey. We we were just we weren't shooting anybody. Okay, we had, she, her eyes got a bit bigger around, and this is Texas, and uh, and, and so hey, we, we get together. Hey, we had our Bible first, and then we pull out our guns later. And I, you thought I was messing around when I talked about it in that order this morning, and I said, hey, we were we were accused of it. No, we seriously, that's what we do around here. And uh, folks from Indiana come to see if hey, are, is it serious? Yeah. Amen. The kid, the kids were like. Are all those yours? <laughs> I was like, all this but your dad's. And uh, laying them down. And uh, we, we were having a good They were playing phase 10, but uh, the kids were. But uh, we had a good time doing that. Just kind of disassembling some weapons and putting them back together. And uh, we thought about having a race a little bit. We should have we raced and see who can get it apart faster. And then who can actually put it back together. And uh, so, <laughs> amen. That's always fun. I'm glad they just stayed for the afternoon. Y'all pray for them. They're, uh, at, at, at tomorrow, they're going to hit the road again. They, they, they're doing a, a, a Texas tour. And, uh, you know, the, the God had to take them away from Texas for a while, but they didn't, they're not gone from Texas. Their hearts are still here. And so they're kind of taking a Texas tour. They're going to head down to Galveston, and then you're going to head to San Antonio, too. Right, and uh, San Antonio eventually and stuff. So they're, they're having a good time as a family and glad they stopped in and uh, spent some time with us and uh, just uh, enjoying, enjoying that. Now, I don't enjoy the fact that the kids are taller than me now, but um, I mean, that's, it's not very, that doesn't mean very tall. I mean, I mean, some kindergartners have already beat me, but, uh, you know, but still, I, I, it still kind of makes you just think, wow, what's going on? And um, it's just not supposed to be that way, right? And uh, kids aren't supposed to grow up like that. And uh, starting to starting to see how, what my parents felt like for a little while, and uh, it's just it's just no good. It's no good at all. So, but glad that they're here. Well, let's grab our hymn books. We're going to sing some more. And uh, I see all those hands. We turn Pentecostal for those that are visiting with us. We turn Pentecostal on Sunday night, and hands go up everywhere. And uh, for a moment, we were singing uh, that last verse. I saw a couple hands go up. I thought, man, somebody's really getting into that song. And then I was like, oh yeah, it's Sunday night. Never mind. <laughs> Miss Janita. 481. Hey Amen. Until the storm passes by. <laughs>
481, let's pick it up on that second verse this evening. Hymn 481, many times Satan whispered, many times. The good news about storms is they do pass. Amen. And the good news about the storm, the Lord, He also controls the storms. Right. And so if He controls the storms and they do pass, then listen, all we got to do is trust Him in the middle of the storm. Yes, and when we get through the storm, you know what a storm brings? Rain. <laughs> Not much of a storm, there's no rain. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, yeah, unless it's far off. But uh, hey, a storm brings rain. Rain brings life growth and many times in our lives you'll find the greatest growth and as you've gone faithful through the storms of life yeah, and thank the lord for that well it's offering time now and the opportunity to give unto the lord a blessing to be able to do so and uh we look forward to what the lord shall do uh through, through the offerings of our church as we continue to give unto him and uh, i was considering i got missionaries here tonight you know and uh let's just be clear cut and transparent missionaries they definitely want to visit churches they also want support, yeah. right? I mean, it's a joy to visit churches, but at some point you want to get to the field. Only one way to do that, yes, right? Only one way to do that. Um, missionaries, all they want is money. No, oh, that's not all they want, but money sure does help because yes, they're called to go to a field. How do you get to a field with no money? Yep. You try it. Yep. You're having a hard time doing what you're trying to do with no money, right? <laughs> and uh, so, and how, listen, how do you do other things with no money? And so, uh, so they. they there's, there's nothing wrong. No, I don't like going to church and talking about money. They talk about money everywhere you go. Walmart, they talk about money. Shell Station, they talk about money. You go, you go to, uh, you go for anything for entertainment. They talk about money. You go to the gun range, they talk about money. <laughs> Lots of money, right? And, uh, and, and then you want to talk about certain money because if you can get that price down just a little bit more, she'll get upset, but she'll get over it. <laughs> yeah, be careful there, careful, and so. See, you don't mind talking about money. It's just a matter of, hey, where, where's your heart? And so, Amen. and uh, you know, it's a blessing to be able to, to have a church that gives to missions and, and to support missionaries around the world. We rejoice in that. And last, ask that you pray for the offering tonight, okay?
this evening. Lexi, you've been waiting so patiently. What? 14. Oh. <laughs> And I got some information for you there. He is at the Atrium Medical Center, and uh, that is uh, out by, um, I just went blank of the street, the uh, Mayhill. Mayhill, thank you. I completely went blank. It was like Mick, Mick, no, no, no I guess, you know, just, it was gone. So uh, Mayhill Road there, so if you know where the QT is on 288 and 35 on Mayhill Road there, that, uh, not 288, the Mayhill and 35, uh, head a little bit north, right around the corner, back behind by the, by the uh, Heart Hospital there. And uh, Atrium Medical Center, room 2036. And uh, so that's where he's at if you'd like to go visit him there. And uh, we rejoice the fact that he is doing much better. And uh, continue to pray for him. This, this afternoon, his, uh, his nose swelled up really big and uh, was turned really red. And so they were trying to figure out what was going on. Realized it was just a clown nose on there. And uh, so, no. <laughs> he threw it at you, right? And... Uh, it's, it's good for you. Yeah, the fact that he's throwing things, that's, that's good. And uh, he's, he's not throwing nurses out. He's throwing clown noses around. And so that's a, that's a good thing. Well, it's good to have the McClure family with us tonight. And uh, we're going to see his presentation here. Do you want to say anything before the presentation? Okay, good. And I, wanted, I forgot to ask you that. And so uh, glad to have them here. And uh, looking forward to what the Lord shall do uh, through our, to our hearts. He's going to preach tonight. And uh, looking forward to hearing, uh, hearing him preach. And... Uh, yeah, amen. My wife's excited about that, and uh, she she gets a little tired of me preaching at her all the time, and so uh, no. <laughs> but uh, looking forward to to hearing that, and so they'll also have a, a, a special or two before he preaches. And uh, I I enjoy stringed instruments. You know, the piano's a string instrument, and uh, some some folks say, well, the guitar you can't use a guitar in church. I don't understand why not. And uh, there's nothing wrong with it. And uh, banjo as well. And string instruments are a great, great tool, a great opportunity to use them. And uh, bless you. And uh, I also, as I watch them play, uh, again, I get a little jealous. You say, why is that? Well, I was a kid. I always wanted to learn how to play the guitar. Always wanted it. And, and so uh, I remember uh, in fifth grade, the, the uh, junior high band came to show us some string instruments. And there was like, you know, just a few instruments you can choose. One was not a guitar. But I always wanted to play the violin, so I said, I'll play the violin to kind of get going, and then from there I can go to the guitar. My mom said, why don't you wait till high school, then you can play the guitar. I said, oh, okay. Not realizing if I wait till high school, Ethan, that's a little too late to start, isn't it? Is it a good idea to start playing an instrument in 10th grade? Not a, not a good idea. Ethan plays a saxophone, don't you? He's like, 
Yeah, and uh, oh yeah, he plays it, and uh, he does a good job at that. And uh, you, you didn't bring it with you, did you? Oh man, and uh, he could have had you play it for the church service, man. And uh, but hey, you know, but, but to, do, to do that, never got that opportunity. So through the years, always been too busy to learn. So I'm trying to teach myself now. And so when I watch folks playing, I'm like, wow, one day, one day, Lord willing, and a lot of hard work, right? And uh, hey, kids, those of you that are young, learn an instrument. Learn to play the piano. Learn to play the guitar. Learn to play something. It'll, it'll do you. You never know how God will use you to you play an instrument. Not that instrument, Brother Seifert. And uh, so, Brother McClure, you go and come. Yeah, pay no attention to the peanut gallery behind you there. So, <laughs> you come. We're going to drop the screen, and uh, it won't hit you in the head. What's that? Should we sing first? Uh, or if you, if you want to sing before the, and then one before the special. Or before the preaching. Sure. Yeah, you can do that, too. Oh, All right. Thank you. All right. All right, well, good evening. My name's Joshua McClure, and this is my lovely wife of 336 days. Yeah, still counting the days. We've been married just under uh, a year now, so it's, it's wonderful. But uh, I'm a third-generation missionary, which means my grandparents are missionaries, my parents are missionaries, and now I have the wonderful privilege of not only taking on the family heritage, but also the Lord's business. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that when you watch the presentation. But in the meantime, we're going to sing a song. presentation keep an eye out for two things both of them are cliffs uh, one is called suicide and the other one is called bonsai they're both effectively named the same thing but I'll tell you the historical relevance right after the presentation
my name is Joshua David McClure, and I used to struggle with these questions until I found the answers. Therefore, I'd like to take you on a short journey to discover how I found their answers and what I'm doing with them now. I was born in St. Petersburg, Florida on January 13, 1988, to Terry and Gloria McClure, who already had two other sons, Andrew and Anthony. The same year, they were approved as missionaries through World Baptist Fellowship to the Caribbean island of Jamaica. I literally grew up on the road while my parents were on deputation visiting all the churches. Then when I was two years old, our whole family moved to Jamaica, where we lived for the next 10 years. But while in Jamaica, the most important event in my life happened. The year was 1995, and the church that my dad started, Hopewell Independent Baptist Church, had the privilege of hosting a mission team that came down to host a vacation Bible school. It was during one of those hot summer nights that I recall being convicted to get saved. So I went forward during the invitation time and my dad shared the gospel with me once more as he had done many times before, but this time it seemed to make sense. Even as a seven-year-old boy, I knew that I was a sinner and that I did not want to go to hell. I therefore prayed and repenting, I asked God to forgive me and save me, and he did. The next few years held some growth, but mostly I was just being a kid. Then in the year 2000, the Lord shut the door for our family going to Jamaica and opened the door to a small Pacific island called the Republic of Palau. I love Palau, Palau. You make me feel wow wow. I love Palau, Palau. You make me... And on January 13, 2002, my dad started the very first and only Baptist church in the whole country called Palau Baptist Church. More than 30 people met that Sunday, and in a man's home, they were all so very thankful that God had answered their prayers in sending a missionary to preach the Word of God. Later that year, my dad started the Christian in Action, or CIA Youth Group, and he challenged us to see whether we were paying attention to God and His will in our life. It was through those challenges that I began to pay more attention to the preaching and I even started to serve in the church by ushering, playing the guitar, and even soul winning. I had done some of these before, but now I was doing it genuinely from my heart. As the years rolled on, I matured both physically and spiritually to the point where I was then leading singing for our services. I was a Sunday school teacher and even the games and activities coordinator for our youth group. Then in the year 2007, at the age of 19, I once again thought on the future and the fundamental questions of life. I knew that I was a Christian and I was on my way to heaven and I also knew that God was the creator. But that still left one question unanswered. What was my purpose in life? I then found the answer in Revelation 4.11, where it says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. The purpose of all life is to please God. Wow, could it really be that simple, I thought? If so, how? With help from my dad and godly counsel, I was able to determine what my burdens were and my desires. So through much prayer and God clearly answering some prayer requests, I knew that my purpose in life was to serve God full time as a preacher. God had called me to preach. So at 20 years old, I entered Bible college, which happened to be the same time I was in my senior year in high school. So I had to double up my classes. I continued song leading and playing instruments. And later I picked up leading our church choir, preaching and giving in home Bible studies. I pursued this course with all of my being. Consequently, I had peace and joy that didn't come from circumstances, but from the Lord. And this too assured me that I was on the right path. I didn't need the world or the media to fulfill my life or to obtain success because I knew I was fulfilling my life purpose. And there is no greater feeling or accomplishment in the world than that. Then in 2011, the Lord opened the door for my parents to return to the United States on a long overdue furlough, while at the same time the Lord directed Andrew and I to stay in Palau and continue the work. 
We were like Titus and Timothy, whom Paul had left in a particular place to watch over and help the work grow. For the next two years, I saw God answer prayers, open hearts, save souls, and bless lives, and even lead me in ways which I pray every Christian may experience, for it is truly amazing. Then after my parents returned from furlough, the Lord began to burden my heart for another island which needed help in the ministry. So I continued my studies, graduated Bible college, and then on January 2015, I moved to the Northern Mariana Island of Saipan, where I have been working underneath my grandpa, David McClure. If you look at the globe, at the United States, you're gonna to need to look for Hawaii. Once you've found Hawaii in the Pacific, go further west until you find an island called Guam. Just above Guam, you'll see an arch chain of islands known as the Northern Mariana Islands. Saipan is one of those islands. There are two main groups in the islands. One is the Chamoran and two is the Carolinian, both of which have their native tongues, but the trade language is English. The predominant religion in the islands is Roman Catholicism. As of 2015, the population was about 55 to 60,000 people. The tropical islands are beautiful. The weather is hot and humid, and the temperature ranges between 85 on a cool, cloudy day to about 105 on a hot, sunny day. Saipan is known for its tourism, and most of its tourist attractions are relics from World War II. The island behind me, Tinian, our neighboring island, is where they held the atomic bomb that they used to drop on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Many people from Asia and the United States to come to visit these sites, such as Bonsai and Suicide Cliff. Many also come here for the dive sites as the ocean is a pristine beauty and its animal life is very well off. Since I landed in January of 2015, I have been busy in the work of the Lord. I have been the song leader and a music teacher for those who want to give their talents back to God. The Lord blessed that I was able to start up the Christians in Action Youth Group, which has been an amazing blessing to pass on the challenges as I received as a youth to the next generation and see God glorified. Our choir has grown and they sang the gospel story in song form which has pointed many to Christ. I have been giving home Bible studies as well as one-on-one -on -one Bible studies. I have been preaching on a regular basis for First Baptist Church. When you get saved, shouldn't you just go straight to heaven? No, because God left us here for a purpose, and He saved us for a purpose. We are here to do something. As the family of God and His disciples, we need to be united in the furtherance of the gospel and seeking the salvation of the lost and dying world. Amen? Yes, that's our purpose of the church, to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every creature. And even for our Chinese congregation, through a translator, when their pastor is unable. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, thou shalt be saved. Maybe you're thinking, saved from what? Hell. 
God will give you life instead of death in hell. The work is plenteous and the laborers too few. Yet still, this is only one of the islands in this chain, and to my knowledge, we are the only Baptist church teaching the whole English Bible in the Northern Mariana Islands. These islands need the gospel, for several are still stuck in traditional spirit or ancestor worship, and others are stuck in the ritualistic and hypocritical idolatry of Catholicism. Please pray for me as I go to share the light with the islands, so that they too may be saved. Also pray for more laborers and preachers, for it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Will you prayerfully consider supporting me and join together so that you too may share in the reward of reaching the lost in Micronesia? Join me to help carry the light to the islands. How many of you saw those cliffs? Yeah? The what? Yes, and the roads that go right to the edge. Uh, those cliffs, actually, during World War II, uh, the Japanese were fiercely afraid of the sleeping giant they had awoken when they bombed Pearl Harbor. Well, when we went back through the Pacific, sweeping through, taking island by island back from the Japanese, they had uh, come to a belief that uh, the U.S. military, in order for an American citizen to join the U.S. military, they had to kill somebody from their immediate family. And this is how brutal we were. Now, obviously, that didn't happen. We know that didn't happen. We didn't go around killing our own families just to go kill the Japs. Sorry, no. Uh, but we were a fierce uh, army to be messed with. And when they bombed us, they woke us up. And we went and we swept back through. And when we came to these islands, the Northern Mariana Islands, they were owned by the Japanese since World War I. And these islands were their stronghold. It, if you notice on a map, they're kind of like an arch shape going up towards Japan. Now, back then, we didn't have planes that could fly far enough in order for us to bomb Japan and stop the war. So we had to capture these islands so we could uh, launch our planes, use the uh, airports there. Well, these islands are like catacombs. So they were dug in. Our planes and our uh, aerial and, and sea assaults didn't do a whole lot. So we ended up landing on these islands and going through and just burning everything. We had to. But by the time uh, we came up to parts of the island, like these cliffs, the Japanese believed and they even convinced a lot of the local people that it would be better for them to kill themselves than to surrender. So they walked up these cliffs. Thousands of people walked up these cliffs and jumped off and killed themselves. That's sad. It's really sad. But you know what's, what's even sadder still is that today, because of the Asian belief system, they believe that when you die, your soul doesn't go anywhere. It stays where your body died. And so they come back and they erect monuments and they put food at the grave sites and they hope that through the rotting of the food, the ancestors will accept the sacrifice and be able to bless them in life. They pray to the dead. Christians, there's no hope in that. We have hope. We serve a living God, a risen Savior. That's what we're going to go preach the gospel. We're going to go share that with them. Now, in the video you did see my grandparents. I worked with them for about two year, a year and a half before I came here and married this lovely lady and began deputation to raise support and get back there. Well, last year my grandpa came back to the States for a knee surgery, a much needed one. And uh, he's of the generation where you don't do anything until you can't do anything else. And then you do it. Well, he had fallen and he couldn't walk anymore, so he needed to get it done. Uh, so he came back, surgery went well, he was out cutting the grass and everything, just doing fine, he's gonna recover for the rest of the year and then head back there come January this year. Well, Thanksgiving morning he had a stroke and on the way to the hospital he had an aneurysm. It was his time to go. So he's with the Lord, he had the best Thanksgiving ever. But that did leave uh, uh, a vacancy, if you will, that I'm going to go back and fill. Now, I was going to go back and work with him and eventually take over. Well, now he's gone, so I'm just going to go back and continue the work he started. Uh, but it is, and let me just encourage the younger people, there's nothing wrong with following in your parents' or your grandparents' footsteps, especially when it's the Lord's will. 
Because there's no greater thing to be doing than what God wants you to be doing. Even if there's bullets flying over your head, it is the safest place to be because it's in the center of God's will. So I'm going to go and continue what my grandpa, grandpa started, not for him, for the Lord. Because that's what he wants me to do. And I'm very thankful to be able to do that. Another thing you didn't see in the video, sadly, I wish it was there, is my wife. <laughs> when I made the video, we, hadn't, we didn't even know each other then. <clears throat> but my wife's testimony, she actually got saved at a young age herself. Uh, she got saved at the age of four and grew up in a godly Christian home. Went to the same church her whole life. She graduated a Christian school, went to Heartland Baptist Bible College. And, uh, woohoo, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I wanted to go there too when I graduated high school. The Lord just didn't have that out for me, but that's okay. And uh, she went through four years of college single. Didn't even have a boyfriend. Whoo, thank the Lord. Yeah. He blinded all the boys. He made, it, he made them deaf, dumb, and I don't know what else he made them, but he kept them off of her, and I am so thankful because he saved her for me. As soon as she graduated, that's when I entered the picture. I had come back to the States, and it's my first time back in the States in 16 years, so this place was foreign to me. I came back in uh, June uh, or July of 2016. She just graduated, and she was going to the Bahamas to work with a missionary family uh, that came out of her home church. And she was just going to go down there and serve the Lord. Well, uh, about the beginning of August, her classmate, which was a missionary kid, I had tried to get in contact with because I was trying to get you know, in touch with people that I knew. And uh, anyways, the sisters ended up realizing I'm a single missionary going to a tropical island. She's a single missionary going to a tropical island. You know, we need to meet. <laughs> So uh, they hooked us up, and guess what? It worked. <laughs> but I met her dad, her two older brothers, her pastor, her church, and passed the pet test all before I even met her. <laughs> that is a task. <laughs> but long story short, and if you want to hear a really romantic story, you can ask her. It is my favorite love story ever. And it is how we met and how I proposed and we eventually got married. But the gist of the story is we met uh, New Year's of 2017. I knew she was the one. The Lord had answered prayer. And by the way, if you're a single person, don't go looking. Wait on the Lord. He will provide the right one at the right time. And guys, if you're not busy, you don't need help. Okay, let that sink in. A wife is a what? A help meet. If you're not busy serving the Lord, you do not need help. Amen. Come on. That's, that's worth repeating. If you're not busy serving the Lord, you don't need help. Okay. Ladies, just serve the Lord. He'll provide. Maybe he's not ready yet. Okay. Maybe you're not ready yet. Okay. It goes both ways. But just wait on the Lord. And I ended up proposing to her on uh, Valentine's Day, February 14. And we got married August 12th. And it is, now the hesitation is because, exciting news, hold on. We've already purchased our tickets and we're leaving August 21st. So I was about to say 21 because we're leaving 21. No, we got married August 12th and the Lord has been blessing ever since. Uh, we've got a vehicle, we've got a place to stay and we have our tickets purchased already. We are leaving August 21st. So pray for us. We're going. And Lord's blessing. If you want to jump on a board, pray for us. We need it. And yes, support's always welcome too. Uh, <laughs> just like you said, we do need it. But you know, we need prayer. That's what we need. And I'm going to let my wife sing a song now that uh, I'm, I'm singing with her. Oh, no. <laughs> But this song is entitled, Every Need Supplied. When you trust the Lord and you serve the Lord, He supplies our every need.
<clears throat> All right, open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter 5. You never know what's going to happen when you preach. You should be ready always, right? Those of you who think you're going to be in the ministry, let this be a visual image for you. It is warfare. <laughs> we say it with a smile, but it is a very real spiritual warfare we're in. And I want to encourage and challenge you Christians this evening that you hopefully we'll see from our scripture reading this evening and uh, from what I'm going to explain that we are in a real war. These things that I'm wearing, actually this helmet I should say, is what they would have worn during World War II. You can still find things like this on our islands because they were left over from the war. Remember I told you it's like catacombs and a lot of these caves were not cleaned out. They just went and covered the mouths so that way people wouldn't venture into them. Well, now here, about uh, 70, 80 years later, they're finding out how bad of an idea that was. Because you can still find not just helmets, but things like this. 50 caliber rounds. I've found three of these already. There's two letters on the bottom to indicate where it was made and two numbers as to when. And the three I found were made in 1943. Still live, still usable. This one is not. That's why there's a key ring in it. Ha -ha. So don't worry, it won't blow up. But you can still find things like this. And I'm going to set this here in front so you can at least look at it. You can also find other things like this. This is a grenade. You all in Texas should know what that is. <laughs> right? Well, you should have like 10 of these in your basement or something. Now, this is a pineapple grenade. <laughs> and no, it's not live. Don't worry. It's been bored out. But you can still find things like this on the island that are still exploding. Back in 2015, they actually found, uh, right after a big storm, they found a torpedo that was actually right beside a ship that had uh, uh, crush, crashed into one of the reefs. They had to evacuate the ship and then try and take the torpedo, and they, they were able to move it without detonating it. They took it out to sea and disposed of it properly by detonating it. But there are things that are still live, still around the island. And though these things, for them, is a reminder of a nightmare, because those who lived through it, it was no fun. No fun at all. War never is fun. And if it is, there's something wrong. War should never be something you seek after. God says that His children are supposed to be those that seek after peace. Those that are the peacemakers. But I want to challenge you to realize that we are at war, Christians. First Peter tells us that we need to be sober, we need to be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, who resisteth steadfast in the faith, the brethren. He is standing against each and every one of us. He is our accuser. But you know, God did not leave us here on this wonderful world he's created defenseless. You know that? Yeah. Ephesians chapter 6, what's it say? He says that we need to take unto ourselves the whole armor of God so we may be able to withstand against the evil one and to fight against the wiles of the devil because he is attacking us. Whether you realize it or not, whether you, you uh, realize it before you got saved or not, you are in a war. Right. Before you were saved, you were on the losing side. You're on right. the devil's side. Right. After you got saved, you enlisted willfully into the army of God, Amen. which, by the way, is the winning side. Amen. If you want to know how it ends, go to Revelation. You'll see that at the end of this book, we win. God wins. But we still have battles to face here and now. And those battles may not be entirely won because we have to fight them right here and right now. Sometimes we win, sometimes we lose. Sometimes the flesh gets the best of us. Sometimes the world does. Sometimes the devil himself does. But greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Christians, we've got the victor. Yes, we've got the comforter, the Holy Spirit. We can overcome. Amen? Amen. Amen? That we can. We can overcome. Now here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we're going to look, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to look 
at verse 14 down to verse 21. Now don't worry about the time. Pastor told me we're usually out of here by 8.30. Yeah. So I've got like an hour and, uh, man, I almost got an hour and a half. Yeah. Y'all ready for this? I hope so. <laughs> yeah. But you know, this helmet gets really hot and heavy. So I'm going to set it down right here. Just to keep a visual reminder, seeing and looking at it. We are in a war, okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 says this. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh, Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we Him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for this wonderful church and your people, Lord, that have come together to hear your word. I pray that we may each grow from what we see in Scripture. We'll listen to what the Holy Spirit has to teach us, and we'll be able to go from here having grown and learn and, and even be able to share it with somebody around us. And if there's anyone here that's not saved, they get saved, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for standing for the reading of God's Word. Jesus Christ, when He was here on earth, He had a ministry and He was here to reconcile. We're going we're gonna to read a few more verses, actually all the way down to the end of the chapter. But He was here to reconcile the world to Himself. And what does that word reconcile mean? It is to, it is a good old word, but it is basically to be the go-between, somebody who makes peace with two enemies. For example, my wife and I, if we were at odds and we were fighting, somebody came alongside to say, pastor's wife, he said, come on, y'all, just get back together. It's not that big of a deal. It's, you know, just apologize and done. She would be, in essence, the reconciler of our relationship. Why? because she has brought us, who are at odds, back into fellowship. Jesus was that reconciler for us. You see, sin has built a wall that has separated us and God. Because He's holy and just, He cannot fellowship with us. Jesus came down to pay the price, the penalty of sin, so that we could have that fellowship, that second chance, with Him. He broke down that wall. But you know... When somebody dies for someone else, take for example, let's use this illustration we have going on here. Let's say five of you are in a foxhole, okay? The enemy takes a grenade, pulls it, throws it in your foxhole. There's five of you. You know what the time, the fuse on this is? What? Seconds. Used to be seven seconds, actually 1941. The French found out that that was too long. It gave people the chance to run away. So for World War II, they, they lowered it actually to four seconds. Close enough. How far can you run in four seconds? That's assuming that when it hits your foxhole, the timer started. They pull the pin, they let that, that release handle go, they throw it. Let's say it's in the air for two seconds. It's conservative. Hits your foxhole, how far can you run in two seconds? Not far at all. So you know what you have? A predicament. A dilemma. Yeah. You actually have two options. Number one, you can try and run. But we already discussed you can't get very far in two seconds. Number two, you've got a second option. One of the five of you could jump on it. Say, so wait a second, who would think of jumping on a grenade? They would. Soldiers would. You see, they're trained to look out for their fellow comrades. Christians, we need to be looking out for each other. But that's not where I'm going with this. Let's just say one of you do. That's a whole other sermon in itself. Let's say one of you do. You know what happens to that person who falls on the grenade? He's dead. He absorbed the explosion. The other four of you, though you might be injured, will live. You know what those four people are left with? after that person has sacrificed, their soldier, fellow soldier has died for them, they're left with a responsibility, an a, uh, obligation, if you will, to live in honor of the one who has died for them. In fact, they'll come home 
and they will share with everyone they know what their fallen soldier friend has done for them. Think about it. We name buildings, streets, highways, bridges. We name them after those who have given the ultimate sacrifice. Let's apply this. Have we not taken the name of Christ upon ourselves? It wasn't a grenade that Jesus jumped on. It was a cross that he died for you and I. Verses we just read, it says that uh, if one died for all, then, uh, then are all dead. We need to live in honor of the one who has died for us. Amen. Understanding that, knowing that Jesus died for our sins, therefore, verse 17 says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a what? You know what that little three-letter word, N-E-W, means? It doesn't mean, I, okay, I like garage sales. I like rummage sales. I like the 50% off section in the grocery store. I love these things, but you know what, those, even if I get stuff from there, they are not new. What are they? They're new to me, but they're not new, they're used, or they're outdated, or things like that. You see, this is not talking about new to you, or new to me. This is talking about something that has never been in existence before. When you come to Christ, and you repent of your sins, and you ask God to forgive you and save you, He creates in you a brand new creature. You're born again. Amen. Something that has never been in existence before. Old things are passed away. All things become new. Amen. Now, when you come to Christ, which, by the way, is very simple. If you aren't sure that when you die you're going to heaven and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, it is very simple. Yes, All you have to realize is that you're a sinner. What's that mean? That means God made some rules. You broke those rules like what? Thou shalt not bear false witness. Everyone has lied. Yes, right? Yeah. All right, how many of you think you're good? Raise your hand. All right, how many think you're bad? Raise your hand. Wow. <laughs> All of you think you're bad, huh? Wow. Let's take the bad test. Let's see how bad you are. Are you ready? <laughs> Pastor, what do you think? <laughs> All right, how many of you ever lied? Raise your hand. Wow. Bunch of liars. Wow. All right, how many of you have ever stolen something? Raise your hand. Come on, you already told me you're a liar. So they're not raising their hand. You say, Brother Joshua, that's not, that's not bad. You know, everyone does that, as you just saw. Really? All right, let's go to the worst of the worst. Let's, how about murder? We often equate murder with being the worst. Thou shalt not kill, Scripture says. How many of you have ever murdered somebody? One, two, three. There's three of us. You're going to find out in just a second, I think just about every single one of you are going to raise your hand. You see, 1 John 3.15 says, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. You see, God's law, his standard is so much higher than ours that he equates the thought with the action. Matthew 6 tells us that if a man looks at, or 5, if a man looks at a woman to lust after her, he's committed adultery with her already in his heart. And in today's day and age, that goes for women too. It's a thought. You see, he didn't wake up one day and just kill somebody. Oh, how'd that happen? No. You thought about it first. The thought became action. You see, God says, out of the heart proceeds evil, yada, 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 yada. Everything. It's out of the heart, Christians. Our heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? So, we've all lied. We've all stolen. We've all murdered. That's only three. Y'all are a bunch of lying, thieving murderers. <laughs> and that's only three of the Ten Commandments. So, yeah, we're all pretty bad. It's very simple. How do you come to Christ? Realize there's a God, which, by the way, here in America, that is... A dying fact. A lot of people don't even know that there's a God. But there is a God. He made rules. You've broken those rules. Because you've broken those rules, the wages of sin is you have to pay for it. But there's good news. You see, the gospel is good news. Not because Jesus died for you and you're going to heaven if you accept him. No. See, good news isn't good without bad news. I've just shared with you the bad news. That's what makes Jesus' death good. You see, you are bad. The wages of sin is death, 
But, Romans 6, 23, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So you realize there's a God, you've broken those rules, there has to be payment, and Jesus was that payment. So now you need to repent. Romans 10, 9 says, If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in our heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Not maybe, not might, shall. You may look at me and say, Brother Joshua, you don't know how bad I am. You're right. I don't. But you don't know how bad I am. That's not the point. The point is God knows. And He put 1 John 1, 9 in there for a reason. That if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Not some, not most or many, but all. That's how you get saved. Now moving past that, once you have believed in your heart and you've confessed with your mouth, you get saved, you're in Christ, you're a new creature, old things pass away, all things become new. Now what? Now it says, all things are passed away and yet everything becomes new. And some people will say this, how come I still struggle with sin? How come I'm still tempted? I still have problems in life. Well, welcome to the human race. You're going to struggle with sin until the day you die because of this stinking flesh. Right. It's corrupted by sin. But again, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. We have the victory. Thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians tells us we need to walk in the Spirit so we don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so you cannot do the things that you would. We need to walk in the Spirit. Not the flesh, Christians. So, now that you realize that, oh, and by the way, I love the verse Pastor quoted earlier, Romans 12, uh, 1 and 2. That concept, you know, we need to present ourselves a living sacrifice. Salvation is not the end, Christians. It is merely the beginning of our lives. Once you've gotten saved, now you've got a, your whole future ahead of you. You've got so much to do. You can do anything, literally. With God, nothing's impossible. Amen. We're not limited, but by ourselves. Yes, sir. Serve the Lord. And if you are, like Pastor said, you get an instrument and you start practicing. I was probably, I think, eight years old when I picked up the guitar and started playing the guitar. My dad started teaching me. And you know what they always told me? You give your talent to the Lord and He will bless. You get an instrument and it doesn't have to sound beautiful or pretty. God says make a joyful noise. Okay? You give it to the Lord and guess what? He will bless it. He'll give you an ear for it. He'll give you the hands to do it. And it'll go from one instrument to the next to the next. And that goes for anything. Amen. If God gives you something, give it back to Him and He'll bless and multiply it, Christians. Yes, right. Keep doing that. Amen. Now, verse 18. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to Himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Uh, we have a job to do, Christians. When we get saved, it isn't the end, it's merely the beginning, and we are here to do something. You know what that something is? Jesus was here to reconcile the world. Is He here anymore? No, He's at the right hand of the Father. He's in heaven. He's coming back one day. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. Oh, me. Come on now. Isn't that wonderful He's coming back? Yes. Hey, man, that should make you want to shout. Yes. And we don't know when He's coming back. It could be tonight. Yeah, right. amen. Yeah, amen. Yeah. <laughs> Tough crowd. Now, you see, when you come to Christ, you've got a job to do. And that job is to be the reconciler between a lost and dying world and God. Now we don't do anything. We don't save people. We don't go around and convict people of sin. No, that's the Holy Spirit's job. Yes, Our job is to be, the, to be the, uh, the preachers, if you will. Romans chapter 9, I quoted a few verses, 9 and 10 for you, but you go on down to verse 14 and 15, it says, how are they going to hear except, uh, well, let me just go there. I don't want to misquote that. I just want to go there. Romans chapter 10, verse 14. How then shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? 
as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. How many of you have shared the gospel this last week? Raise your hand. All right, how many of you have shared the gospel this last month? Keep your hand up. How about this last year? Surely you've shared the gospel this year. Okay, good. Now look at your feet. Oh. <laughs> God says that your feet are beautiful. Those that are sharing the gospel, those that are preaching the gospel of peace. Amen. You see, our job, right there in this verse, it says that He has given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. And He's given us the word of reconciliation. Christians, you don't need to go to a college to give you a piece of paper that tells you you're competent to share the gospel. Right. All you need is this book right here. If you, well, I should stop and say you need a relationship with God first. But that's a given. Because without faith it's impossible to please God. When you have a relationship with Him, then all you need is this. Because you already got the Holy Spirit. He's the teacher. He's the one inside that tells you what's right and what's wrong and all that. You need this. How many of you got a red Bible? Hold it up. Red Bible. Hold it up. Red Bible. Hold it up. One, two. Wow, got a, quite a few. You know the only good Bible is a red Bible? You know that? I'm not talking about the color. <laughs> if you never read your Bible, it'll never do you any good, Christians. God, now, I'm not limiting God. God can do anything. But He's not going to use what's not there. Yes, if you don't take His Word and put it in your heart and put it in your mind, He's not going to use it. Yeah. Take His Word, memorize it, apply it. Amen. It's the best thing you can do. Sure, go to college if you want, if that's what the Lord wants. But you need to study this book. Share the gospel with those around you. You see, the point of missions isn't something that starts across the world somewhere. Right. Mission starts here. Amen. Now, I know I'm not necessarily from here or part of your church, but the fact still remains it is the commission of what? The church, right? Yes, Who's the church? It's not pastor. Right. It's not this pulpit. It's not the building. We are the church. Amen. So whose job is it to go into all the world and preach the gospel? Right. Ours, not pastors. Amen. Not Joshua and missionary. No, it's all of our job. Now, yes, pastors included in us. I'm included in it, but it's all of our job. You know, one of the sad things I've seen traveling around the States is some people treat the pastor and the church like they treat the government and taxes. They come to church and they give their tithes and offerings and they say, hey, that's what I pay you to do, Pastor. You're supposed to be out there preaching the gospel and winning souls. Yeah. Yeah. No. That offering plate's not pastors. Amen. It's not y'all's. It's not the church's. Amen. Whose is it? When you give to give, you're giving to God. Yep. It's His offering. And by the way, He doesn't need your money. Right. Think about it. What does He do with gold in heaven? He <laughs> streets with it. If He needed more gold, He could take up a street. Or just make more. What's he do with, gold, uh, with uh, diamonds and rubies and jewels in heaven? Foundation of the new Jerusalem. He makes one gate out of a giant pearl. Wow. What kind of a clam made that? I mean, whoa. My point is God doesn't need our money, our finances. You know what he wants? It's our heart. Amen. Where your heart is, there will your treasure be also. Amen. See, when you give your heart, your pocketbook will follow. Yes, sir. You're not giving because the church needs it, because pastor needs it, because a missionary or the lost souls need it. You're giving because God's giving you an opportunity. Catch it. An opportunity. It isn't a, a something you're going to have to do. No. If you treat it as something you have to do grudgingly or of necessity, you're going to miss out on this opportunity. Amen. He is giving you an opportunity to grow your faith. Amen. See, Malachi tells us he'll open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. There's not been room enough to receive it. Luke says, given it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give unto your bosom. Give. And by the way, you can't outgive God. Right. He's no man's debtor. He will, he will give back to you. I have seen it. Three generations worth. My parents, my grandparents, and now in my life. And it's nice to hear preachers say it, and it's nice to hear other people say it, but you know, it doesn't become real until you do it. That's right. 
your own personal life. And you start seeing God work, it's like, wow, that's amazing. I was praying back in, uh, well, I think I th we left here, actually. Right after here, we, had, we went to uh, uh, Georgia. And I was praying that the Lord would provide me a hard case for my banjo. Because I needed a banjo. I didn't have this nice hard case that I have now. I needed a bag. I, I mean, I had a bag, and I needed one like this. And I was like, well, Lord, you know what I need. I just, I'm just going to keep giving. By the way, I give to missions, too. Amen. I'm a missionary, but I give to missions in my home church. It's so all of our responsibility. But I'm going to be faithful. It, it, it's, it's a scary thing if I don't give to God. Yes, you know? Now, I'm going to be faithful in giving. God knows my needs, so this is how He meets my needs. I was praying for a hard case. And you know what God did? This is our wonderful God. He didn't just give me a hard case. I went to a, a missions conference in, in Georgia. I got this hard case, but I also got a brand new banjo with it. Now, if any of you feel this, this thing is heavy. Now, I don't know how much it is, but I don't really want to put a price on it. I just thank the Lord for it. Amen. You see, God knew my need, and He decided to go above and beyond. A man in Georgia looked at my banjo, old banjo, and he looked at it and said, uh, I believe if you're serving the Lord, you should serve Him with the best. He rebuilds instruments for a living. So he came and he said, I got, a, I got a banjo I want you to look at. And he gave it to me. He said, play it for the afternoon, and if you like it, I want to trade you. I took it out of the, I mean, I just saw the case, and I was like, oh, man. Whew. And I looked at it, and I was like, I wanted to shout for joy and say, yes, right now. So I took it, and I played it that afternoon, came back that night, Sunday evening, and we talked about it, and it was awesome. That's how the Lord provides. He goes above and beyond. Now, let's just say, for example, I'm not saying that it is, but let's say that thing's caught. Those instruments are expensive. Yes, sir. They go well over $1,000. Some go up to two and $3,000. Yes. I'm giving my tithes and my offerings and missions. Now, my tithes, if my tithes is $1,000, I'm, I'm rolling in the dough. <laughs> but it is not, okay? But I'm giving to God what He has pressed upon my heart and my tithes which I'll tell you, it doesn't equate that much. And yet the Lord decided to give that to me. Amen. That's what the Lord does. Now this is only one story. The Lord gave my wife a, a ukulele. She's been playing that thing. She's been doing an awesome job. But I, my point that I'm trying to get you to see is when you give to God, it is an opportunity to grow your faith. You're stepping out on faith saying, God, I'm giving this to you. You'll take it. You will multiply it. You will do what you do. And I'm just going to keep trusting and serving you. And he is going to turn it around and multiply it and give it back to you. And you'll get a fraction of what he multiplies it into. And if it's anything like that, wow. Amen. Just wow. Yep. I am the king's son. Amen. I'm a prince, heir to the throne. God's just going to take part of his riches and give them to me. Amen. All right, now I've got to hurry. Finish this up. It's already past my time. Verse 20. You all enjoying this? I was joking. I'm not actually going to go to 8.30. Okay? All right, verse 20 and 21. <laughs> now then, we are what? Does your Bible say the same thing, ambassadors? We are ambassadors for who? As though God, beseech you by, uh, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. For he, that, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Amen right there. Thank the Lord that we had a Savior who is perfect without sin. He died for us. The perfect Lamb of God. Amen. But you know, he called us a name. He said we're ambassadors. You know what an ambassador's job is? I'll tell you real quickly. His job, he is called and appointed to, to the office of an ambassador. He's sent into a foreign country, and his job is twofold. Number one, he's there to be the reconciler between the foreign country and his home country, to make sure that trade stays the same, that there's still peace going on. But his job is also, secondly, to minister unto his fellow countrymen. You know, if there's a natural disaster or something, he's there to take them out of that country, bring them back home, that sort of thing. Now, he's called us ambassadors. You know what that means? Let's apply it. He calls us and says, we are called to salvation. You realize when a person gets saved, they didn't do it on their own. 
God is already doing a work in them. We preach the gospel. God's doing the work. We're only responding to what the Holy Spirit's doing inside. Romans 3 and Psalms tells us both that no man seeks after God. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. Salvation's not of us. Amen. It's all of Him. Yeah. And so when a person hears that, when they realize they're a sinner because of the law, they respond to what the Lord is already doing in their heart, and they get saved. Isn't that awesome about God? Yeah. He doesn't just give us life and a new home and a new name and a job and the equipment to do the job. He further takes it a step and says, I'm going to do the job for you. Yeah. What's there left for us to do? Be faithful Amen. and preach. Yes, sir. That's our job. Preach. If somebody shuts the door in your face, please don't get discouraged. Amen. They're not shutting it out on you. Right. They're shutting him out. Right. It's nothing personal against you. It's against Him. Keep preaching Him. Now an ambassador, again, applying it. He's called us to salvation. He has sent us into a foreign land. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasure is laid up somewhere beyond the blue. I'm going there one day. I haven't seen there. I haven't been there yet. But one day I'm going. That's my home. So I'm in a foreign land, a foreign world. Even in America, I'm a foreigner. What's my job? Twofold. Number one, to be the reconciler, to be the peacemaker, to try and convince a lost and dying world that the best place to be is in our home country, which is heaven. They need to get to know our president, our king, God. And it's also, secondly, to do good unto all men, especially unto the household of faith. Our job is to be ministering to each other as well. Right. Scripture tells us we need to bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Our job is to help each other, pray for one another. It's getting quiet. Come on now. We're here to do a job. Now nobody likes an elected or appointed official who's being paid to do a job and he's not doing it. Think about it. Let's say you hired somebody, they're supposed to be doing a job and all they do is sleep on the job. How do you feel? Think they're going to keep the job very long? You're going to pay them? No. Now, I hope you got your, your, your army hats on. How do you think God feels when we're not doing our job? Amen. He has saved us for a reason. That's right. He has given us life. A, uh, a well-known atheist, uh, his name is Penn, uh, Penn Gillette, I think it is. He's a mag magician. There was one day a Christian who went in line with a Bible to go up to him with the purpose of giving him a Bible and witnessing to him. He gave the Bible to him, and he was shocked. Now, I'm not saying his statement word for word. I can't quite remember the quote. But he basically got on later on. And he's an atheist. He didn't get saved, none of that. But he got out there, and he said a, prof said a profound truth. He said, how much do you have to hate somebody to think that heaven's real, hell's real, that you've got hope and you've got life. How much do you have to hate somebody not to share that with somebody? And that came from an atheist. Christians, we've got hope, we've got life, we've got truth. How much do you hate your neighbor that you don't want to share it with them? How about your brother or your sister, your spouse, your parents for that matter, or your children? The faith of a child most frequently convinces the parents. Amen. How much do you have to hate somebody to not give them the gospel, the good news? That's our job, to go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We're the reconciles. We're the ambassadors. We've got a job to do. Don't fail God. Amen. He's going to do it with or without you. But what a wonderful reward if he can do it with you. Amen. It's wonderful. I'll tell you, I'm going to go preach the gospel to some people I don't even know. A place that's foreign. In essence, I, it's kind of home to me because I grew up out in that region. But you know, there's still all kinds of people I don't know. Chinese, Korean, Japanese, Australian, all the different islands. And I'm going to share the gospel with them. Why? Because somebody took the time to share the gospel with me. Amen. And I'm a debtor to Christ, to the cross. Right. I'm going to share it. 
Not because I feel like I've got a debt that I need to pay. No, I'm going to do it because I love my Savior. Amen. And I really do have hope. Yes, I'm going to share that with everybody. That's right. There's nothing else in the entire world that I want to do or that I can have peace about doing and sharing the gospel. And I know my wife feels the same way. And that's where we're going. So I ask you, please, get a prayer card. Pray for us. Stop by our display. We've got uh, fruit from the islands and hot sauce, too. But take a prayer card. Pray for us, because prayer is what we need. Yes, money works. Yes, money is helpful. But you know what? I serve my heavenly Father who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He will supply. <laughs> that can be a joke, man. He'll supply. I don't doubt him. Let's all stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to share the message you've given me and to preach your word. Lord, I pray that every person here this evening, if they're not saved, will get saved, and every child of you will get in a closer relationship, walk with you. Lord, it is our job that you've given us. Thank you for being our Father, and thank you for providing our every need. Love you, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.